Okay, good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome to our MCR Healthcare Showcase. My name's Bobby. I am the Head of Alumni Operations and Engagement here at Oriel. Um, really big thank you to our panelists and to the audience for joining us. Uh, we're just going to run through a couple of very brief housekeeping bits. The first of those being that this talk is recorded. And the uh, second of those being that if you do have any questions for our panelists, we will take questions at the end of each of their presentations. So if you'd like to pop them in the Q&A box, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, but that really is all for me. Um, I'd just really like to say thank you to our panelists, Lauren, Asmi and Jesse for coming and speaking today. And uh, now I'll just pass you over to our first panelist, Lauren. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me just see if I can get this screen share working. Bobby, are you able to see it all clearly or is it going to be the bar still? Uh, yeah, I can see it all fine. Perfect. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Lauren. I'm a third year DPhil candidate in genomic medicine and statistics and I'm based up at the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics and I'm supervised by Rachel Bashford-Rogers and Julian Knight. And I'm here this evening to talk to you a little bit about my research which has focused on sepsis. But first, I want to clarify, because I get asked this question a lot, sepsis is not blood poisoning. Uh, so people often use these terms interchangeably, but while blood poisoning can lead to sepsis, sepsis is actually defined as the body's dysregulated host immune, re immune response to infection. This means that sepsis can arise from a variety of different causes. So something as simple as, for example, a urinary tract infection, so a bacterial infection, or something like a fungal infection, viral, or even as a result of surgery. However, in as many as 50% of cases of sepsis, we actually don't know the cause of the underlying infection. Things to look out for in an individual that might be suffering from sepsis are fever or hypothermia. They're often confused or disorientated. They can uh, complain of stomach pains, nausea and vomiting, and they often have a, a sort of black, a blotchy skin rash. And sepsis has been described by the World Health Organization as the final common pathway to death for in severe infectious diseases. So that really highlights sort of the critical nature of uh, and the, the critical nature of sepsis. So as I explained, sepsis is the dysregulated host immune response to infection. And despite the fact that it is clinically well defined, it actually represents a remarkably heterogeneous patient cohort. And this is because you have the interaction of a variety of different factors. So for example, the host genetics and their microbiome, but also the environment. So when they were identified as having sepsis and the therapeutics that you applied, but also you have the additional heterogeneity that's introduced by the pathogen. So as again, viral, bacterial, fungal, the genome, and whether they've got any uh, drug resistances, for example. So sepsis has a, a very high mortality rate. So even in developed countries, the mortality rate is estimated as about 30 to 50%. And actually this corresponds to approximately 11 million deaths per uh, worldwide per year. And actually the incidence is increasing year upon year. And we don't know whether this is due to sort of increased and improved reporting or whether this is something else, for example, um, the sort of clean hypothesis that we're, we're not being exposed to pathogens uh, like we were in the past. But despite this high mortality and the increasing incidence, no sepsis specific therapies currently exist. So we're currently limited to organ supportive uh, care and sort of really just vasosuppressors and antimicrobial treatments. Because of this, the World Health Organization has actually declared sepsis a global health crisis but it's remarkably challenging to research because of this heterogeneity, both within patients and uh, with the presentation of the disease. Because of this, the UK Critical Care Genomics Group launched a study called the Genomic Advances in Sepsis, which is also termed GAINS, in 2005. 
And the main purpose of the study was really to begin to characterize and stratify patients with sepsis so that we can begin to identify novel biomarkers, we can predict outcome on a patient basis and begin to advise more personalized treatment. And even beyond that, perhaps we can then look at individuals who might be susceptible to developing sepsis and what those risk factors might be. So since it was launched in 2005, we've actually recruited more than 2,400 patients at around 30 UK hospitals. And for those patients, we've recruited a variety of different samples, for example, uh, whole blood, urine, plasma, and at days from one to seven post ICU admission. So we really can study the disease course and sepsis. And one of the main sort of aims of GAINS was to also get extensive clinical metadata so that we can begin to predict outcome on a per patient basis. So what's interesting about sepsis is it was traditionally considered a biphasic disease. So there was a peak in mortality around weeks one post ICU admission, where you would have that hyperinflammation and a cytokine storm. So the release of a lot of different chemicals within the blood, but then two to three weeks after that sort of initial uh, peak in mortality, we see a second peak in mortality. And that's characterized by immune suppression, the acquirement of secondary infections and ongoing organ failure. But what's become increasingly clear over the past 10 years as clinical care has improved is that actually the 30-day um, mortality in this window is decreasing and more and more patients are surviving that sort of first four weeks of infection. But what this has actually revealed down the line is that three to four months uh, post ICU admission in the acute phase, we're actually seeing a third peak in mortality that's really quite poorly understood. And this phase sort of lasts from three to four months to up to a couple of years post ICU admission compared to people who've been in ICU for other causes. And it's characterized by 60% of patients being rehospitalized, and as many as one in three uh, survivors of the acute phase will actually pass away in that first year. And this is quite often due to secondary infection. And this highlights that really there's an ongoing state of immune suppression in sepsis patients that we don't understand. And it's also characterized by sort of additional um, problems for these patients. So they suffer from physical and cognitive impairment, and they also often uh, develop mental health disorders, so quite often PTSD in these patients. So if we can begin to understand this long-term disease progression in sepsis, we will go some way to improving that outcome and perhaps restoring the immune system to a state of homeostasis. So my default, default is primarily focused on the adaptive immune system and studying those long-term changes that might underpin that susceptibility to secondary infection and death at the three to four month period. So I'm really aiming to sort of characterize those, those changes, assess what the functional relevance of them is, and if I can identify any changes, how I could restore those to homeostasis to improve the outcome in individuals with sepsis. And to do this, I'm actually utilizing the sample bank from GAINS um, to really characterize patients and reduce the heterogeneity in my sample cohort. So I've got a, a sample study size of 42 uh, individuals with sepsis, each with three time points during the disease course and the extensive clinical metadata. And I'm performing complete sequencing of the adaptive immune repertoire, which I'll discuss in detail on the next slide. And this is going to be hopefully one of the largest sort of longitudinal studies of the adaptive immune repertoire in infectious disease and also in immune mediated disease, which encompasses the sepsis response. So first, what is what is the repertoire? Uh, apologies if some of you already know this, um, but essentially the adaptive immune system is comprised of two key cell types. So these are the B cells and the T cells. And on these cells, they both express a unique receptor, which is termed the B cell or the T cell receptor, respectively. And these are vital at binding to antigen. So the B cell receptors are the, the membrane bound formed of, form of antibodies. And each uh, receptor is unique, but they are related across different B cells. And an individual B or T cell will express multiple copies of each receptor. So the pool of B cell and T cell receptor rep uh, receptors that you express is termed the B cell and T cell receptor repertoire. 
And through a variety of different mechanisms, it's possible to generate approximately 10 to the 11 different sequences within an individual. And this is really important because it allows you to respond to the variety of pathogens that you encounter throughout life. But these repertoires can be quite affected by a variety of processes, such as selection in response to being exposed to a certain pathogen or disease. They can also be affected by immune mediated diseases, for example, uh, lupus, and they can also be affected by uh, immunomodulatory therapy. So to study these B, B cell and T cell receptor repertoires, we use what is called a polymerase chain reaction. So I'm sure we're all very familiar with that because we're using it for the, the COVID testing. And I'm essentially doing a, a similar technique, um, although it's slightly more complicated to amplify or enrich for these sequences, which I can then uh, sequence on a high throughput scale. So I've shown on this slide just an example of a couple of repertoires in different immune mediated diseases. So you can see on the left, a healthy volunteer. We've also got Crohn's disease and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And what you're actually looking at is the, the adaptive immune repertoire for B cells. So each node is a unique B cell receptor sequence and nodes are connected when they are related together. So they differ just by one, one sequence in the, in the receptor. And when you see clusters, that suggests that clone is responding, it's uh, multiplying in response to a pathogen and it's diversifying to try and uh, improve its, its affinity for the pathogen that it's exposed to. A healthy individual, like you can see on the left, should be relatively diverse. There should be a sort of characterized distribution of different effector functions. So each receptor can have a different effector function tagged onto it. And that's what the colors represent. But you can see in the immune mediated disease, so in the Crohn's disease and the lymphocytic leukemia, quite apparent are these big clusters of cells that are sort of dominating the repertoire, but also this shift to different effector functions. So in the top patient, you can see that the repertoire is overall more red, and that's a shift to the isotype IgA1. So you can see there is a sort of profound variation in, in the repertoires in different diseases. But they can also be affected by things such as age, sex, and the therapy that the individual has uh, received. Sepsis is very interesting in that it encompasses both immune mediated disease response, but also clonal expansions due to infectious disease. So really the repertoire in sepsis can, is hopefully going to be quite interesting. So I've performed a, a trial study on some in individuals with sepsis, which you can see uh, in the repertoire plots on the bottom of this slide. And essentially comparing them to the healthy individuals, we can see that actually, uh, unlike the immunidated diseases on the previous slide, there does seem to be less obvious shifts. But actually, when you compare the statistics to go along with these uh, network plots, you can see that actually there is increased clustering and a decreased repertoire diversity. If you have decreased diversity, that suggests you'd be less able to respond to different pathogens. But we can also see shifts in the effector function. So, for example, there is elevated IgE usage. And IgE usage is often associated with allergic response. However, we're seeing that in sepsis without e e evidence of allergy. Similarly, we're seeing uh, differences in IgG usage. And actually, this has been shown in the literature to improve survival when you treat patients with sepsis. So it's not unsurprising that within the adaptive immune repertoire, we might be seeing uh, alterations in the, in the IgG usage in septic, septic, septic patients. Of course, when you're doing a study that's involving 142 individuals, you can't just compare cluster plots. So here is a, a plot showing the V-gene usage um, within those 142 uh, samples from 42 individuals. Now, V-genes actually comprise an important part of the B-cell and T-cell receptors in that they form the first part of the antibody, for example, that binds to the pathogen. So you can see in the little plot on the right. And actually, we have a variety of different V-genes that we can use. And this is quite important because it generates the diversity in the receptor but actually different B genes have been associated with different autoimmune conditions. And what you can begin to see in the, the patients that I've starred here is that there does seem to be a sort of um, abnormal sepsis patients where the B gene usage is quite different to the green individual who is our healthy control and also the rest of the sepsis cohort. 
In the, the white block, I've also highlighted the sepsis patient who has leukemia in addition to sepsis. And what you can see very nicely here is a massive clonal expansion shown by the, the block of all one B gene, which is the, the expanded tumor. So it's a sort of nice case in, in point that you're picking up clones. And we can then, then begin to use this to sort of correlate to different uh, measures of prognosis in sepsis. Another interesting uh, phenomena that I identified in these patients is that actually there seems to be deviations in the proportion of the repertoire that is functional. So when you're generating a B cell receptor or T cell receptor, the RNA can acquire mutations, which means it no longer generates a functional receptor. And what you can see is that the majority of individuals, and in fact, healthy individuals in general, about 85% of the repertoire is functional. However, there seems to be deviations in certain sepsis patients where as many as 15, uh, sorry, as many as 25 to 50 percent of the repertoire is non-functional, which you would imagine significantly impacts their ability to respond to different pathogens and might underpin why they're susceptible to secondary infection. So most of that analysis is ongoing. Unfortunately, my lab work was quite limited by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm going to finish on a success story from the lab, which really highlights the benefit of these genomic approaches to sepsis and to stratifying patients. And this is a study performed by two of my predecessors, Katie Burnham and Emma Davenport. And they recruited 270 patients with sepsis caused by community acquired pneumonia. They performed gene expression profiling, so they took the RNA from the whole blood and then looked at the, the expression of a huge panel of all the human genes. They then began to cluster the uh, gene expression of different individuals to try and identify groups of patients. And what they found was very interesting. So essentially what you can clearly see on the plot on the left is that the sepsis patients group into two very distinct groups based on their gene expression. And we termed these groups sepsis response signature one and sepsis response signature two. And when you begin to look at the genes and the outcome for those individuals, you can see that those who fall into sepsis response signature one are relatively immunosuppressed. And actually this correlates with a much reduced survival rate within that cohort. By comparison, sepsis response signature two is relatively immunocompetent and they have a better sort of survival rate from ICU admission. What was remarkable about this is that we can see the uh, divide within the sepsis patients using the genetic data, but we can't see it based on clinical data alone. So you can't separate it based on, for example, um, temperature or lactate score, for example. But then this has proved to be very relevant for disease and treatment of disease during sepsis. So a second study was performed called the VANISH trial, and this looked at the effect of different treatments on patients with sepsis and their outcome. Now, quite often uh, steroids are given to individuals with sepsis as part of their, we're gonna give them a cocktail of drugs and see whatever helps them survive. Um, and what you can see very clearly on the plot on the right is that individuals who are SRS1, who are given the hydrocortisone treatment, it seems to make no difference to their survival probability compared to the placebo. But if we look at SRS2, who are actually relatively immunocompetent and you give them steroids, which suppresses the immune system, their survival probability drops dramatically compared to treatment with a placebo. So we can envision a future where if we can test for these SRS groups on the bedside, it might allow us to advise patients um, what treatment should be performed because you know, quite clearly giving steroids to SRS2 seems to sh show no benefit and it's actually detrimental. So I'm going to leave you with a few concluding remarks um, based on this research. Remind you that sepsis is the life-threatening immune response to infection. It's not blood poisoning. It's a global health crisis and the incidence is increasing. It's a very heterogeneous re uh, disease which has really limited our research. So my research focuses on the repertoire and our ability to respond to pathogens which is implicated in immune-mediated disease. My study aims to characterize the alterations in sepsis, which will hopefully allow me to reveal novel biology and explain that third peak in mortality that we see in sepsis. As a whole, sepsis research is extremely challenging and unfortunately underfunded, but actually genomic approaches like those that we take in the lab are really sort of improving our ability to identify novel patholo pathology, categorize patients, 
um, and hopefully improve the treatment for individuals with sepsis. Although it's important to note, unfortunately, it's not yet available in the clinic, although that's something we're working on at the lab. I obviously want to say a big thank you to both my research groups and my supervisors, Rachel and Julian, for all their ongoing help through what has been a very challenging time for us all, um, but also the patients and clinicians who are part of the genomic advances in sepsis study, because without them, I wouldn't be here doing this research. Thank you for listening and feel free to ask any questions. Thank you so much, Lauren. Would you mind just unsharing your screen and we can do the yes. questions, sorry, quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, yes, we've had uh, a question from Jason Dorset. He says, uh, hi, Lauren, what would it take to get this into the clinical use? What was that, sorry? Can you just- oh, Sorry, uh, what would it take to get this into clinical use? So. Uh, so that's a, an interesting question. So for the, the characterizing the SRS groups and looking for the prognosis, we're actually working on a, a bedside test. So what I didn't explain is that the, the current approach profiles all of the human genes, um, and then that uses an expensive technology called RNA sequencing, and it's a lot of analysis. But we're at the moment, um, we've reduced it to a seven gene set, which actually allow you to characterize patients into either group we can then translate that into a PCR test, which we're optimizing at the moment. And hopefully, um, if that's working, it will become as simple as you send off a blood sample like you do with COVID, there's a PCR test. And based on that, we can tell you what SRS group you are and hopefully advise on treatment. Yeah, thank you. Um, then another one from uh, Maurice Snell. In this context, does heterogeneous mean that sepsis can affect anyone? So, <laughs> It's more referring to the fact that you have so many factors that influence disease. So it can be basically any pathogen. It can be from an insect bite. It can be from a urinary infection. Um, it really is a challenge to characterize the disease because it all leads to sepsis. But what we see is that there are um, genes upregulated that are driven by viruses. Then there are those that are driven by fungus or um, even those driven by the certain strain. And because of that, it becomes very hard to characterize patients when they just present to you uh, with fever, for example, because actually underlying that fever, which is a classic symptom of sepsis, are all these different factors that are contributing to disease. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another one from Charles Fox. He uh, asks, of your cohort, how many were known to have immune suppression on admission? Might not be a question. <laughs> So one of the patients has obviously the um, lymphocytic leukemia and two have rheumatoid arthritis, but uh, not active disease. And the rest, a criteria for gains was no pre-existing pre immunocompromise. Um, so that really helps the study. And then a, another from Mark Tapley. Is there any relationship between sepsis risk and rheumatoid arthritis, which I understand to be an immune system disorder? Um, I think the issue with sepsis is we don't really know what is causing it. So there have been a couple of studies that have identified a few genes that might make you at risk of infectious disease um, due to sepsis. Uh, but actually, we don't really know. Um, that's what we're hoping to study. One, one of the big issues with sepsis research is actually you can only identify the patients once they've got sepsis and there are quite significant changes to the immune system. So trying to backtrack to pre-sepsis and work out what actually their, their state looked like before they acquired it is, is quite challenging. Okay, and uh, a final question uh, from Nicholas McLean is, uh, you gave a figure of 30 to 50% of mortality. Can you give a figure for lives saved by emergency treatment? I don't have a figure on me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a leading cause of adult ICU admission um, and it was 40 million cases globally. So if we can really improve that mortality rate, that's gonna save a lot of lives. Um, and, uh, thank you very much. I, th I think that's all of our questions uh, for yourself. But obviously, thank you so much for uh, presenting. And um, yeah, we'll have an opportunity to take questions for all of the panellists at the end as well. So please do stick around. But um, otherwise, yeah, I'll uh, pass over to Asmi uh, if he's happy to take over.
Hello. Hi, Asmi. Hi. Um, I'm just trying to get that. There we go. Is that visible? Yep, uh, I, I can see that. It's all fine. Okay, fantastic. Um, great. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, I'm Asmi. I'm one of the DPhil students at the Nuffield Orthopedic Center up in Headington. And um, one of the buildings decided called the Botner Research Center. Although in the past uh, year or so, there's been a lot of work just from my own room with work from home. Um, and what you see on the slide is the, is the title of my thesis, but I quickly realized that if I was the one attending the talk today and saw that, that I'd probably struggle to stay interested. So what I tried to do was to sort of reframe the presentation to talk about something that everyone here has probably either experienced directly or indirectly uh, through someone you might know, which is, sorry about that, which is chronic knee pain. So what I'll do over the next 15 or so minutes is to talk about why, what the, one of the biggest reasons why it happens, um, what are some of the existing solutions for it, and what can really be improved on that front. And through these tenets, I'll try to effectively capture uh, a bit of what my lab does and what I uh, had the opportunity to do in the past two years that I've been here. Um, great. So I just thought before that, I'd give a bit of an introduction to myself and how I got involved in orthopedic engineering. So I grew up in Singapore. That is me in 2011. It's a pretty terrible photo of me being what they call the cheer drummer for the student council. From 2012, I did national service for around three years, first with the army and then with the police force. And then in 2015, I decided to change gears and fly to London, uh, where, I did, where I started on my medical degree. And before coming here, I knew that I was quite interested in research, but I didn't know what I should particularly look at. And so I was advised by a few people to try and explore as much as I can. And so I spent the par, a good part of the past six years in between um, curriculum to try to dabble in various things from medical physics to wet lab genetic work, dry lab informatics work, which really didn't work for me, as well as doing some clinical audits. And through doing all of these, I learned two main things. The first being that I really enjoyed the sort of work that is at the end of a traditional research pipeline, which is the sort of work that can very quickly be translated to patient care. And I also very gratefully learned that if you spend enough time with a single research institution, that um, they would eventually be willing to pay for you to study and work for them. And because all of that worked out, uh, it kind of led to me doing a integrated BSc in bioengineering at Imperial. Uh, and while I was there, I spent quite a fair bit of it look, studying biomechanics at quite some depth. And that's what really cemented my interest in orthopedic engineering. And following that, I took some time off my medical program back in 2019 to come here. And that's more or less how I started this uh, pathway in doing a default. So that's enough about me. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was orthopedic implants and how they affect patients. So orthopedic implants are what you can describe as a form of medical augmentation, which is really the art of combining man-made technologies with human biology to improve the quality of life. And these are used in a variety of areas in orthopedics. Um, in pediatric orthopedics is used for the correction of scoliosis or the bent, uh, pathological amount of bending of the spine in children. Um, it can be used to replace large amounts of bone, muscles, and ligaments that are removed in cancer surgery in bone, uh, quite commonly called osteosarcomas. And they're also very often used in the replacement of damaged joint surfaces. And going down this list, it sort of sounds slightly less and less interesting and exciting, but Unfortunately, we do need to be data-driven sometimes. And it is, it's some, something that we've uh, come to realize um, across orthopedics is that this last point on joint replacement has by far had an overwhelming amount of evidence for having an unmet need uh, for patients around the world where there are a lot of people who are suffering from 
damaged joint surfaces. And so the need for joint replacement can be a whole lecture in itself. But what I'd like to do is to introduce the reason it is used in 98% of surgeries, which is as a solution to knee arthritis or knee OA, osteoarthritis. So at the top, um, this picture here, you can see a healthy knee, which has a good amount of joint space. Um, so in an x-ray, you see bones, you don't see the soft tissue, which are other parts of the body that are not bones. And so the area that you can see as a gap is not really just empty space, but it is full of um, cartilage and meniscus and other tissues that really keep the knee working properly. At the bottom over here, we can see that that extra tissue, that tissue that helps the knee work properly is gone. And it is when these contact surfaces of the knee thin out and fail to allow for an effective uh, and painless use of the knee that knee arthritis really comes to bear. And knee arthritis is really what we can call a target rich environment, which means to say there's a lot of issues uh, that you can quite easily find a problem to try to work on. To give you a bit of understanding as to how it affects people, one, lots of people have it. Um, in the Western world, everyone here has a 50% lifetime risk of developing some form of knee arthritis. Um, and the incidence, meaning how likely it is to happen, is 37%. So 37% of people above the age of 60 actually have uh, knee arthritis. Uh, some key factors which predispose it are aging, which would apply to everyone, obesity, which applies to those who don't really plan to be too fit, and sports injuries, which also apply to those who are planning to be fit. So it's easy to see why knee arthritis tends to affect a lot of people. And it's important to also realize that it's something that will not kill you, but until it is resolved, it will give you quite a miserable time. So when a patient has knee arthritis, the best solution really is conservative treatment, um, which, is, which refers to changes in patient lifestyle and um, the sort of um, food they consume, the sort of uh, practices that they have, which um, effectively is, you can group up and mention as having to lead a less inflammatory lifestyle and trying to also correct any uh, anomalous gait that the patient might have, any anomalous manner of motion that the patient might have. But unfortunately, by the time we detect knee arthritis, these measures are often too late. And on top of that, there is limited success in these attempts for various behavioral and socioeconomic reasons as well. So the next step really is medically, what can we do? And there are injections. Um, and there are painkillers that you can take orally as well. So you have painkillers, you have steroids, which are effectively anti-inflammatory as well. And there are also experimental treatments such as patient plasma. And the problem with these is that they aren't really solutions as much as they are temporary measures in trying to reduce pain and inflammation. And we also know that they lose effectiveness over time. And finally, surgical. So there are certain bone cuts that you can do to reduce loading in the knee joint. And these are called unloading osteotomies. So they can be high tibial or low femoral osteotomies. But however, these are also um, temporary prevention measures. And what we really do see is that at the end of the day, the, fa the failure with knee arthritis is that failure at the joint contact surface. And so the ultimate solution always uh, has been up to today, a replacement of these joint surfaces so that they're able to work better. And so because of the demand that I shared in the earlier slide and the real ultimate need for having surgical intervention, what we see is that in the UK, there are 100,000 total knee replacements that are conducted every year. And this is in the UK alone. And this number again is growing very quickly. But unfortunately, the story doesn't end there because what we have here is a bell curve of the satisfaction of roughly 3,500 patients who've had a total knee replacement six months after they've had their surgery. And the, their satisfaction is measured using what's called an Oxford knee score. It is one of many types of questionnaires that patients are given to see how 
well they are with their knee in terms of pain and function. So a, a healthy young person with um, knees that work perfectly fine, which would be many of you listening today, will have a score of 48. And what we see when we look at this graph is that there are two main features. The first one is that in a very small number of cases, the patients are really quite unhappy. And these are usually for clinically obvious reasons. So after having a knee replacement, there are things like post-operative infections, the implant coming loose, or perhaps the patient might fall and have a fracture. And these are complications that require further surgery. And in that time, the patients would really be quite unhappy. Um, but thankfully, these are few and far between. In a much larger group, in some studies up to 60%, what we see is that patients do not fully regain pain, uh, regain function. And in many cases, more than 60%, um, and really in some studies that we've seen up to 90% uh, or more, patients still report having some level of pain after having a total knee replacement. So it is better than their preoperative state, but they still don't really go back to the way they used to be when they were younger and fitter. So the key takeaway here really is that knee arthritis is prevalent and it's debilitating, debilitating, sorry. And a majority of the therapies that we have so far are not sufficient. And so the question you might ask is why hasn't this been fixed? And why is it a challenge? There are quite a few reasons, but in large part, it is because the knee, unlike quite a few of the other joints in the body, is really quite incredibly complex in the way it is formed and in what it does as well. It is complex in its anatomy, and that's what I've tried to capture here in this slide. Uh, here we have a th real 3D reconstruction from a CT scan, which is effectively x-rays taken on three different axes, which is what you see on the left. And they're all put together to show what the knee actually looks like, the knee joint looks like. And what you notice is that the, the anatomy of how the bones come together is really quite uh, complex. And on top of that, what you don't see in the x-rays, which is shown in the graphic on the right, are the ligaments and the cartilage that is really in between all of these um, bones. And each one of these lines um, in this graphic really point to a different part of the knee that serves a specific mechanical function. And on top of all of that, the knee doesn't just stay static, it also moves, and it moves in many different ways. The motion that most of you are familiar with is flexion extension, which is a normal bending of the knee where you bend it uh, in and out. There is also, on top of the normal bending of the knee, what we call a varus valgus motion, which is where your calf bends left or right. And on top of that, there is also anterior posterior motion, which is where your upper leg and your upper and lower legs, which is your femur and your tibia, are either being squeezed together, such as when you are standing on your leg, or being pulled apart, which can happen when you're, say, having a massage or lying down in bed. And finally, there is rotation, which is when you turn your body while your foot is uh, down on the ground. And so there are effectively six rate degrees of motion of the knee. And while the first one, the flexion extension, is what we're all most familiar with, the other three, while they appear small, really have quite big implications for loading and load distribution in the knee. And it is a combination of this complex structure as well as the motion of the knee joint that makes it a real challenge uh, to try to get an implant to work because an implant will need to fit well into this complex anatomy and at the same time be capable enough to allow for all of these motions of loading and contact stresses without um, interfering too much with what a patient would want to do. So it, the knee is complex and the implant will need to cater to this and right now there seems to be a gap in that. So at our lab, we focus really on what we call one-sided arthritis or medial arthritis. Um, so one-sided arthritis can be either on the inside or the outside. There, if it's on the inside, we call it medial arthritis. If it's on the outside, it's called lateral arthritis. But in most cases, it is on the inside half and that's what we'll be talking about today. So traditionally, 
the solution for medial arthritis. Uh, sorry, pardon me. Traditionally, the treatment for any uh, knee arthritis, including medial arthritis, is a total knee replacement. And it is used because it is relatively straightforward as a procedure. And as part of orthopedic training, a lot of orthopedic surgeons around the world are trained in it. However, in the context of medial arthritis, what you will notice is that it, there requires a lot, it requires a lot of bone to be resected. If you notice um, a couple of slides earlier, where we take a look at the actual knee. So in this case, there is only a small region, well, the inside half, which is damaged, but the actual solution is the replacement of the whole knee. And that requires a lot of bone to be resected. And it's also important to remember that there isn't any spare space in the joint meaning anything that you're putting in requires an equivalent amount of bone to be taken out. And a total knee replacement is quite a big uh, implant. So fitting it in requires bigger incisions. And because of that, it also indirectly requires a bigger incision, a bigger cut to be made. And that increases infection risk and scarring as well. And most importantly, uh, you're also replacing healthy and perfectly functional, perfectly functioning uh, lateral compartment, which is the outside half, which isn't damaged, as well as the sacrifice of multiple healthy ligaments, which hold the knee together, which weakens the ability of the knee to keep together and work as a tight unit. So in short, for the purposes of medial arthritis, um, a total knee replacement is a bit of a dirty operation because there are quite a few other things that you need to sacrifice. In contrast, there are what we call unicompartmental knee replacements or UKRs. So these are, there are quite a few variants out there. The most commonly used um, around the world is called the Oxford knee or the Oxford unicompartmental knee replacement. And it was developed in, the, in Oxford in 1976 by Professor John Goodfellow and Professor John O'Connor, one of whom was an orthopedic surgeon and the other was a mechanical engineer. And if you look at the pictures on the right, you can see that it's quite a substantially smaller implant compared to a total knee replacement. And so we tend to um, be able to step away from the issues that come from having a bigger implant because there is a smaller implant, we have less bone loss, and because you don't have, it doesn't get in the way of all the other ligaments, all the ligaments also are intact. Because it's a smaller implant, you can also perform a smaller surgery. And by virtue of requiring less material to make it, it's also a more affordable implant for the NHS and for the patient by extension. And also um, a very important characteristic, which unfortunately for the sake of time we can't talk about today, is that it's fully unconstrained. And what that means is that the knee is able to perform all the motions that it normally does, the flexion, the extension, the valgus varus, the rotation, and so on, without being constrained by the implant. Whereas with the total knee, because it's bigger, it tends to constrain um, the motions in one way or the other. So this is one of the main reasons why a unicompartmental knee replacement can be looked at for medial arthritis. So does it actually work better? So over the past 15 years or so, there have been some really rigorous studies that have, performed, that have been performed, and they all come to rather similar conclusions. They find that a unicompartmental knee replacement works remarkably better for patient outcomes uh, in terms of pain and function, but it also has a higher risk of subsequent surgery that is needed. And the most common of these subsequent surgeries, what we call revision surgeries, are progression for osteoarthritis or arthritis in the coming decade or so after having this knee implant, or a dislocation of the bearing that is put uh, into the knee, it's part of the compart it's part of the implant itself, or the implant itself coming loose. And in general, there has been uh, following these studies and following training and adoption of you know, compartmental knee replacements, uh, growth of these procedures being performed around the world. However, the issue of subsequent surgery needed remains, and so the work that really our lab does is trying to improve how we how. Uh, improve these numbers and trying to minimize them so that they further improve uh, outcomes for patients. 
So one change that uh, we have explored to reduce revision um, is to use cementless variants of the implant. So in the picture over here, um, you can see on the top pictures of the actual implant, and you can notice how the one on the left has a smooth surface and the one on the right has a bit of a rough surface. Now, the reason it has a smooth, smooth surface, um, the one on the left has a smooth surface, is because traditionally all implants are inserted using a substance called bone cement. And what it does is that it helps to hold the implants in place. The x-ray on the top demonstrates this quite clearly. There is this interface of cement between the bone and the implant. So with a cementless variant, you're effectively taking that out and you're putting this uh, implant directly in place in hopes of trying to reduce loosening and improve fixation. The reason this has not traditionally been done is that the sort of procedure that you're doing needs to be a bit more precise. But we have found that that is possible using advancement in, tech in um, the approach that the approaches to implantation that have been made. Um, what caught us by surprise when we did this was how much better the pain scores were. So what you notice from the slide here is the lines in black are cemented, the lines in pink are cementless. And we noticed that 45% more patients who are, um, take 45 more of the cementless patients are having remarkably no pain at all compared to the cemented cohort. And less than 75% oh, of the patients are reporting having any pain that is more than what we call moderate, uh, well, more than mild pain, so moderate, severe, or extreme pain. And if you can recall from what we were talking about earlier, um, contrast this to total knee replacements where less than 10% of patients actually report having no pain at all. So why is this happening? Well, this is a bit of unfinished work, uh, but we have come to realize that cementless knees for a variety of reasons adhere to the bone at the tibial wall. And the tibial wall is what's circled in the x-rays on the right. And we have... Uh, somewhat convincing hypothesis as to why this affects pain, because uh, adhesion to the tibial wall reduces the loads that are going through the knee and going through into the tibia, which is where the pain is occurring. We don't know definitively if this is what's happening yet, but we do know that the fixation has gone up, as you can see in the graph, quite uh, simply, from cemented to cementless, with the images as well as the graph, you can see that fixation is getting better. Is this directly related to pain? We don't know yet for sure, but it's something that's being studied. So this is one side of the story. Another big question uh, that we try to address is fractures. Because what we've noticed is that this is not very much a concern in the Western population, but it is more common in the East Asian population. A Japanese study last year found that um, the implants that are used in the UK are the same that are being used there. And there is a very concerningly high 8% fracture rate in patients who are having these implants. And so we're looking at ways to modify the design to reduce this. And unfortunately, the work here needs to be a bit under wraps. But what I can share is some of the in-house techniques that are being used in the lab to assess how the average Japanese knee is different from the average British knee and what can be done to reduce the risk of fracture. So on the left here, um, we have finite element modeling. So that is where the knee as well as the implant itself is computationally emulated and it's simulated to try to see what the forces are. So as to try to um, see what the loads are and um, make modifications to the implant itself to try to reduce the fractures. Of course, it needs to be brought to practical testing. And so in the middle, we have what's called micromotion analysis. So this is where um, you can take effectively a sequence of images of the interface of where the bone is, um, or in this case, a bone emulating foam and uh, a prototype implant, and to see how exactly it affects the strain on the bone surface. And the strain will, through mechanical formula, be able to tell us what the loads are and what the forces are within the knee itself. And I'm not sure if this is visible, but ultimately we also do some force analysis and load analysis where we load to fracture and we try to reduce 
or we try to increase um, the loads that need to be attained before fractures happen because that reduces the risk of fracture. And so we do have a graph that's going up over here, which is hopeful. And hopefully very soon we can share that data um, in public. So to really summarize, um, knee arthritis is prevalent and it's debilitating. And a majority of therapies are not really sufficient to uh, resolve it for patients. The knee itself has pretty complex anatomy and motion as well. And treatments really need to cater to these complexities. Implants that are developed need to be able to fit to this complex anatomy and motion. Um, we know that unique compartmental knee replacements provide better results than total knee replacements when appropriate, i.e. for patients with medial arthritis. But of course, further improvements can and should and are being made for uh, unique compartmental knee replacements to try to make them even more safe and even less painful. And I guess before I close, I just want to mention that in the big picture, it is important to recognize that all of what I've talked about today really fits into one part of the Venn diagram. And while the implant itself is the most important factor, the success of surgery is also heavily dependent on surgeon proficiency, as well as how well the instruments work um, with the surgeon and the implant. And these have their own areas of work needed as well. And taking a further step back, um, it's also important to recognize that these surgery related factors are one of three key elements of how patients will be after surgery, because the quality of the lifestyle that they lead, as well as the support and the care measures that are offered to them by family and society will also play equally important roles as to how patients uh, knees recover and how they are able to live with them for the rest of their lives. So I hope that gives a bit of insight into knee pain and what uh, our lab at the Oxford Orthopedic Engineering Center is doing to try to solve it. And the work that we really do here is part of a much bigger group of people. And unfortunately, I've not been able to have everyone's picture on the slide here. And it's a, it's a fair bit of collaborative work that comes from data from the, well, the Nuffield Orthopedic Center where we work, the Oxford University Hospitals as a whole, but also national joint registry data from across the country as well as joint registry data from across the world, such as New Zealand, and I haven't been able to find other pictures, but we also have um, other parts of Europe as well. So I, with that, I'd like to come to an end. And if anyone has any questions, it would be great to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asmi. That was uh, really interesting. Um, so yeah, could uh, open the floor to any questions, please, if anyone has any. Well, actually, Asmi, just one for me, incidentally. Um, when you said uh, there was more fractures in, in Japanese knees compared to Western knees, is that more to do with uh, genetics or is that or, or just surgery or lifestyles? Or do you think it's a combination of those things? I was just, I was just curious about the difference, really. No, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, well, unfortunately, I don't. There we go. That's what we were talking about. Um, that's a very good question. And there is no definitive answer as yet. Um, as I mentioned, this data was only published for the first time last year. Um, what we suspect is happening is that um, it is a mechanical effect. So as a consequence of genetics, but it's a primarily mechanical effect. Because what we do know is that um, not only are the patients generally smaller, um, uh, elderly patients in Japan, what we also know is that the structure and the anatomy of the knee is slightly different. And because of these anatomical differences, there are loading distributions that vary between varying the knee as well. So what we tend to see is that there is a bit more of a load that extends medially or into the inside of the leg um, in Japanese patients compared to, um, say, uh, an average British patient. And so this might be predisposing it as well. So what really needs to be done to sort of, you know, answer this question definitively is um, to have these hypotheses that, um, that we've just talked about, but also, and this is a common theme in um, implant development, is to actually take, um, well, either cadaveric knees, or in our case, we took a 3D reconstruction and we um, tried to make that into a foam um, 
prototype as it were of the knee analog of the knee and test on it to see if the numbers actually change if it actually gets better and if it does then we know that um, that was probably the reason but until it actually gets to the final testing and verification step we can't really be sh very sure uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, that's a really, really good answer. Um, so, first question for another question, sorry, from Nicholas McLean. Uh, are um, many of the same principles uh, applicable to hips? The design principles and the sort of approach to designing and improving them um, are definitely applicable. Um, the good news with hips um, and the, the reason they're not as well studied as the knee is because the results and the outcomes are remarkably better. We know that most patients who have a total hip replacement, um, who have a total hip replacement usually for hip arthritis, so um, the sort of equivalent for knee and knee arthritis, are happy with their knee, are happy with their hip. Most of them report very little pain, if any, and most of them are able to get back to um, some semblance of their life before they had arthritis. What we do, what we see is that that's not happening with knees. And um, th that's for a variety of reasons, one of which, uh, some of which we talked about, which is to do with anatomy um, and trying to cater to it. Um, so yeah, so the principle and the design principles apply to hips, but thankfully research is not necessarily needed because um, the day it's already doing well. The work that tends to happen with hip replacements is trying to improve the way the surgery itself is done rather than change the implant itself to reduce the risk of infections, to reduce the risk of blood loss and other perioperative outcomes. Thank you. I'm sorry, I should have said this. Would you mind unsharing the screen as well? Just the, the view oh, comes yeah. back. Yeah, sorry, thank you. But we can still see you, so don't uh, worry too much. Uh, a question from Graham Stanley as well. Uh, with the cementless implant, does the human body then secrete something uh, to firmly attach the implant? Ah, it's a very good question. And it's uh, actually very interesting. Um, well, the, knee, the bones themselves are very interesting uh, live organs, really, that people tend to overlook because they seem like they're not moving. What um, bones have is a set of live cells called osteoblasts and osteoclasts and another set of cells called osteocytes that are always moving around or living within uh, the bone itself. And so there's a lot of hormonal um, interaction and mechanical interaction that happens within bone in general, not just in the knee, but all across the body. And this is why we know that if a certain part of the bone had, um, has a lot of force on it, it ends up becoming thicker and ends up becoming stronger because the body naturally tries to cater to that and tries to make the bone stronger where it is needed. Similarly, with a cementless implant, when we are putting it in, we make it a much tighter fit than with cemented implants where you put the cement in place and you kind of squeeze it in. So it kind of fits in snugly, but it's not tight. Whereas with cementless implants, it is tight. And so there is a force there. And because there is a force, the bones are able to detect that extra load. And you have these osteoblasts, meaning they, uh, yeah, these osteoblasts which come in and they start depositing more bone in place and they try to make it stronger. Well, what we also see is that if you put um, what's called hydroxyapatite, which is really just a calcium phosphate coating, um, that also tends to trigger these osteoblasts and they tend to get a bit more active and they come and jump on and um, improve um, fixation as well. So yes, the body itself does secrete things, but it's more of a mechanical interaction that helps to firmly attach the implant. Thank you. Um, another one from Jason Dorset. Are your conclusions any different for patients having single or double knee replacements? So that's, again, a very good question. And it's uh, something that's very actively studied um, in Imperial, actually. Um, the Imperial Center does what we call bicompartmental, and they study bicompartmental knee replacements. So. I guess I'll split the question into two things. One is, what if you have a knee replacement on both of your knees, your left knee and your right knee? So some of the evidence suggests that there is, we have patients who are very healthy and happy with knee replacements in both knees. However, what we do know is that if you do the surgery at the same time, your 
the patients are less able to really move for a while because they're not able to offload on one knee and put load on the other knee. And so that process of um, not being able to walk more on the knee does uh, worsen the, uh, their recovery. So it's fine to have knee uh, replacements on both knees, but they shouldn't be done at the same time is what the data is showing. And in the same knee, if you have one on the inside half and the outside half, that is done. That is a surgeon preference, whether they want to do an inside half and an outside half or just replace it with a total. And the outcomes are still not very clear because they're quite rare. But at the moment, it's really surgeon dependent. So they'll look at you and then they'll decide based on what uh, their expertise and how the patient's presenting, whether or not they should have a single or a, a double or a total. So I hope I kind of answered that question. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, uh, three more questions, but I'll make these the final ones. But um, so one is from Sandy McCauley. Uh, are there any clinical indicators of good outcomes postoperatively, e.g. from x-rays? Clinical indicators of good outcomes. Oh, so that's, a, again, a very good question because um, there are many different things that you can look at when uh, a patient's recovering and the way they recover um, early can quite uh, effectively tell you how they will do in the long term as well. So one of the things that you really want to look out for is in post-operative recovery, how much um, pain the patient's are having immediately post-op. So this is between zero, so right after surgery and within six weeks. And what we tend to notice is that patients who have less pain are able to mobilize more and they're able to put more loads on their knees. And the faster they're able to do that, the more they're able to stretch it out and get their body to, well, integrate with the knee better. And the better they're able to do that, the better um, the outcomes are in the long term. Looking a bit further down, of course, you want to look at x-rays because if you start looking at radiolucencies where there are areas of uh, bone becoming thinner, then you know that the implant is not really attaching as well as it should be. So that is sort of a risk factor. Um, and that's something that you tend to look out for as well. Um, a big thing that um, I personally am a big proponent for, and um, I, uh, it's also quite widely adopted, are what called patient reported outcome measures. So these are where you ask the patient really in a very objective way, a set of questions about how their knees are performing, how they are feeling in terms of um, pain, in terms of mobility, general quality of life. Are they able to get out of bed? Are they able to get out of their car? And you are able to give them a score. And so monitoring the score over time is a really useful way both for research and for clinical follow-up to see how patients are doing. So these are some clinical indicators. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, uh, another from Nicholas McLean. Um, so have you come across any cases of uh, knee capping, which is a sort of a process where someone might be shot in the knee? Um, would something as traumatic as this um, make for much more complex surgery and healing in the sort of the nature of the implants? I mean, absolutely. And you know, the very nature of it is it's, it's trauma. And so um, Naturally, uh, again, take a, a, st a step back. When we start, when I started this talk, I mentioned how we're talking about knee arthritis and uh, trying to solve knee arthritis and implants for knee arthritis. And that's kind of where unicompartmental total knee replacements come into play. Really, when you're talking about something like knee capping, um, that is, you know, much bigger acute trauma to the knee. And when you start talking about acute trauma, the sort of um, interventions that you need are going to be quite different. Um, the term total knee replacement is quite a generic umbrella. I used it here as a sort of contrast to unicompartmental replacements, but really totals can be used for a whole variety of reasons, one of which is um, treating um, uh, patients who have, you know, uh, undergone trauma such as that. And not just, you know, that, but also patients who might have road traffic accidents or who have, may have had a large fall and fractured um, their knees as well. The surgeries tend to be more complex because there's more bone that needs to be resected. You put in implants, again, total knee replacements, which are much bigger because they need you need a lot more um, fixation and things that are smaller are just not going to be able to hold things in place. And these things tend to have a lot more pain involved. And you really want to make sure that you do it best, as good as you can the first time because replacing them and revising them is only going to get even harder. So it does increase the complexity of the actual surgery. 
it increases the complexity of the implant that needs to be put in. They end up using modular implants where it's not just a single one, but they are multiple ones that are attached together. And um, the healing also takes a lot longer. And of course, the patient will be in a lot more pain. Yeah, so not very good. No, <laughs> thank you. And our, our final question uh, from Mark Tapley. Uh, are there any major advances also in material science that are relevant to these implants? Um, there were a couple big paradigm shifts that happened um, in the past decades, um, which have already been you know, shown but not talked about in, in these slides here. One is, as I mentioned, the hydroxyapatite. Um, so over here. So the addition of hydroxyapatite or this coating to, um, to uh, knees and, well, to the implants. And because what we noticed that when you do that, the bone is really able to much more effectively grow and stick onto the implant. So the implant itself is exactly the same. And you're using this expensive, really good metal and you're putting that in place. But um, the addition of what's relatively a much cheaper and much simpler coat of uh, really just a powder really makes a much uh, a significant difference to how well it really attaches. In the context of this, you know, we're still exploring it, but hydroxyapatite as a coating is used in multiple um, sort of orthopedic implants and it's sort of a general thing you look at. Um, the use of bone cement is actually a big thing, uh, a big material advancement as well. It really started with dental implants and kind of came from there. And we realized that being able to fill the space minimizes the sort of shaking that you tend to notice uh, that patients tend to um, have when they're using um, their implants. And this is very relevant in knees because you're always putting your entire body slope. And really, if you look at the mechanics of it, much more than just your body weight, multiple times your body weight through it. So you really want to hold it in place. So the cement makes a big difference. Um, we've also noticed, um, you know, it's not just metals and other fancy things, plastic. If I can just jump back very quickly here. Oh, sorry, Plast actually, you're not on the um, oh. share screen. You want to put it oh. back on again? Oh, am I not? Oh, oh well. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, it's fine. Um, there is a little plastic bearing. Uh, we call it ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, but it's effectively plastic. Um, and advancement in the way that plastic is developed and cross-linked and put together also reduces how likely it is to break apart, how likely it is to slip out of the knee uh, or the implant, and that also improves things for patients. So materials plays a big part as well. Okay, well, um, yeah, I think that's all of our questions. But yeah, Asmi, thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting. And um, yeah, I think uh, if you have to stick around with Jesse, there might be a few final questions at the end. But um, yeah, I'll pass over to Jesse now, if that's okay. But, uh, thank, you very thank you very much, much again. All right. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to start with a disclaimer that I'm not uh, a health researcher. I'm an economist. And so I, if I'm ever saying anything that is a little bit wrong, I'll take any corrections at the end. If I'm ever saying something that's criminally wrong, uh, please feel free to jump in. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the problem of antimicrobial resistance. And the way I'm going to frame it is to try to convince you that it's an urgent problem. Um, it's also an economic problem. And it's one that is economic in the same way that loads of health crises we are experiencing at the minute um, are manifesting themselves. And it's not the only problem of its kind. Um, so here's a collection of facts on antimicrobial resistance. So um, every year, 700,000 years are attributable to resistant bacteria. Um, and this number is projected to go up to 10 million billion per year by 2050. So, so this is a very looming, um, catastrophic and global problem. Um, the, you're probably familiar with the way it happens. Some bacteria become resistant uh, from exposure and mutations to um, antimicrobial agents, which are supposed to get rid of them. And so this is a stochastic process. There's loads of risk that's um, very hard to predict that's associated to it. And the more we go over time using 
the same agents, the likelier it is, it is to happen. So an illustration of this is from a, a meta-analysis of the, the resistance to um, various antibiotics in um, H. pylori, which is a, a stomach bug. Um, and you can see that in studies before 2000, um, in particular for the antibiotic levofloxacin, for fluxacin, um, you can see very sharp increases in the prevalence of resistant strands, strains within the, the population of that, uh, of that bacterium. Um, so the um, one quote that I find summarizes very well what's going on. Um, so that's a quote from the, um, the, US, um, the US President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And the key ideas in here, in the fight against microbes, no permanent victory is possible. This reality underscores how essentially this to embark now on a course of action that will ensure an effective arsenal of antibiotics that is continuously renewed. And I'm going to focus specifically on the renewal of, of those antibiotics. So we're currently in a severe antimicrobial slump. Um, as you can see, the, the number of approved um, antimicrobial drugs over the period of time um, between the 80s and now um, has decreased substantially. And this has had implications on, on the activity of the, the antimicrobial sector. So for instance, major pharmaceutical companies have curtailed their antibiotic research programs. And it's a very unprofitable moment to be an antibiotic company, which is primarily smaller, um, smaller companies. So, so why, why is this happening? Why is there this slowdown in the development of antimicrobial drugs? One of the main problems is they're very unprofitable, in particular relative to other pharmaceutical products. Their, their cost, um, because the, of, of access concerns, are, are kept rather low. Um, the, the, other, the other way this, this manifests itself, um, in a study by Taos et al., um, the cost of developing those uh, antimicrobial agents is shown to be very, very high especially relative to the profits that they generate. So 1.5 billion, the cost of developing a new targeted antibiotic, excluding the post-launch study, of which 708 million are preclinical research and development costs. So that's about 40, 45%. If you put that in comparison with the commercialization profits, which are only 46 million, you understand why it's so much more profitable for pharmaceutical companies to develop musculoskeletal drugs, cancer drugs. And another reason why this is the case is that patients have the unfortunate tendency of, uh, of getting better. And so there's, there's this idea that supply in the case of, of, pharma of um, uh, pharmaceuticals in general and antimicrobial agents in particular destroys its own demands. Um, so that, um, that happens in particular because we're finding it more and more difficult to find truly new antimicrobial agents. No radically new antimicrobial process has been discovered since the, the late eighties and economic research on innovation in health in general has found that the, the discovery of new molecular entities, enemies, has fallen by 3.5% every year between 1970 and 2005. Um, in comparison, the research effort, which is the number of high skilled scientists that you can afford with the R&D spending associated with that, uh, has seen an average annual increase of 6% over that same period. The, um, the other way um, this is a problem, in particular in the case of antimicrobials, is that the, the treatment cycles are usually short, um, which is a good thing because people get better faster, but that also means that the sales volumes are gonna be relatively low in comparison with other drugs. And also that sales volume in and of itself cannot be an attractive measure, um, in particular because resistance, antimicrobial resistance increases in probability with the usage of any one particular antimicrobial agent. Um, and, and also the, um, the, the, the resistance management policies themselves 
uh, have a tendency to stifle demand. For instance, the way antimicrobial, the antimicrobial population at the minute is being managed um, is by rotation. So some will be prescribed and then go on to um, break periods of, of two or four years in which an antimicrobial that has a different um, a acting principle will be, will be used and prescribed more actively. So what happens as a result is that the burden of, of that innovation is, is shouldered in, in particular by more charitable initiatives, um, such as the Wellcome Foundation, the Gates Foundation, um, the, or a Carbex, um, which is an American program. And then some financial initiatives which have tried with very dissatisfying results mm -hmm. to, um, to emulate uh, an interest in innovation in that sector from the private, from the, the financial sector. So as you can see, there's a very difficult trade-off between the access and affordability of safe medication on the one hand and the profitability of research on the other. So it, it is definitely an economic problem. Now to economic problems come um, economic lingo. So the, the idea of, of the effort uh, at the minute is to try and find which kinds of incentives make it um, more attractive for, uh, for discovery and, and research uh, and development in, um, in new drugs. So there's essentially two kinds of, of, of approaches. The push approach is to um, implement measures that make it easier to do the research effort, regardless of whether there's a success at the end. And of course, this is good because success is very uncertain. So it's important that you encourage um, research from a blanket perspective. So the, the, those kinds of, of policies are, for instance, tax incentives. So you can give tax credits <clears throat> on research and development. You, um, you also see a, a flourishing of product development partnerships in which hospitals, universities, um, private bodies, and the state come together in concerted effort to fund the research upstream. Then pull incentives are the ones that once the product that works, that is safe has been found, makes it easier for those who develop the drugs to reap the benefits. Um, and of course, there's an, the, there's an obvious attractiveness to this as well, but some trade-off with the push, uh, between the push and the pull incentives. So for instance, you can get the simplest form of that is market entry rewards in which you just make a big cash transfer to whoever puts a new antibiotic on the market. You can also fast track the, um, the review uh, and the, the approval of those drugs. For instance, in America, the FDA approval by the Food and Drugs Administration. Um, and then the particularly tricky question of um, intellectual property policies, whether you want patents to be very restrictive or whether you want them to be actually quite permissive. And this is talk that's come up a lot in the, in the vaccine debate, because if you think you have your vaccine and, and, or any really any innovation in front of you and you ask, well, should everybody be able to use and, and, and commercialize that? The answer is obviously yes. Now the problem with incentives is that if you do so, doesn't it make it less uh, attractive for the people to do, to put in all that effort, all that upstream investment into the development of those products. So there's a concern that this will actually stifle the, the production um, and research in the first place. So as you can see, this is difficult. And then there's, there's hybrid incentives, which really just uh, combined the push and the pull approaches um, as is particularly the case in orphan drug legislation uh, for drugs, for, for diseases which are so rare that the, the production of, of effective medicine is in fact uh, bound to be unviable economically. And things like fast, fast track options, uh, particularly in America where you can buy a permit to um, expedite the development and approval of a drug and the money that you give for that permit is then used to support public sector research and development. So combining the push and the pull approaches. Now, my, my particular interest in this topic is about the patent policy regimes. So a little bit of law history on something called the Bowler exemption, which is uh, named after uh, the famous case Roche, uh, Roche versus Bowler from 1984. So the story goes that um, Dalmain, which is a sleeping pill, 
um, was patented by Roche and was due to expire in January 1984. Now, in, in 1983, ahead of the expiry of the patent, um, a Canadian company, Bola, uh, started using Dalmain's active ingredient, fluorazepam, um, in order to do the research that was required for the filing of a new drug application to the US Food and Drugs Administration. Now, of course, Roche was not particularly happy about that, and so they sought an injunction on, in July 1983. Um, and the district court, which uh, reviewed that request for injunction, um, so the district court for the District of New Jersey, um, found that the use of the, the product that had been done by Bola was not illegal because it was for testing and investigation strictly related to the approval of the drug, not the commercialization. So even though they weren't licensed the right to use the active ingredient, they, they were in their right to use that, the, the, the material itself in the prospect of developing the drug themselves and then commercializing it. Now, uh, Roche appealed that ruling and the US Court of Appeals decided that um, actually no, if you, if you start doing research in uh, ahead of commercialization, you actually have a business purpose. And so your use of the product does not fall under a research exemption. And, and so the, the experimental use by Bola was disqualified. And an interesting point that they made, and that obviously was heard by the court, was that this meant that Hosh would reap the monopoly on the generic drug after the patent exp expiration. So in fact, you were giving even more property rights than you thought you were by preventing other companies from carrying research ahead of approving a generic drug when the patent expires. Now, the, the US Court of Appeals heard that, actually acknowledged that point, but said, this is the lawmaker's problem. We only look at what's in there and, and, and you're not within the limits of the law. And the law was very quick to react. So in, in 1984, the, the Drug Price Competition and Patent Term Restoration Act, which is dubbed the um, hatch Waxman Act of 1984, gave that exemption specifically for the purpose of FDA approval. So it's a, it's a rather narrow exemption pattern. Um, and this was mirrored in EU legislation by the Human and Veterinary Medicines Directive, which was last amended in 2004, which granted exemption only to necessary new drug application research. Now, of course, the, the EU law was, was transposed to national law and that uh, happened in a relatively disharmonious way. So the understanding of what is necessary for the sake of approval can be either broad or narrow. Um, for instance, in a broad, exemption regime, you might include clinical trials as something that is allowed by the exemption, or you might exclude them, uh, which, uh, which is a narrow exemption. And so there's, there's a push in, in recent years to harmonize across European national laws. And, and that pushes towards a broadening of the Bowler exemption. So including more um, more use of the, of the product whilst it's still patented, even without license of right. So here's when uh, economics comes in. And I'm going to spare you the, 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 the Greek alphabet soup. And this is of no interest to anyone involved, but this is just uh, uh, an example of what it looks like in, uh, from an economic theorist's point of view. Now, the, um, the main results that I get from this, which is my, my MPhil thesis, um, the groundbreaking finding that the smaller the cost of, of drug research and development relative to the profits once the drug is developed, the, the higher the willingness of firms to invest. So th this is not particularly surprising. Now, what is more interesting and nuanced is that actually when you introduce um, a restrictive paying policy, okay, um, with a narrower kind of bowler exemption, and or, for instance, intellectual property extensions, such as um, SPC supplementary protection certificates, which 
account for the time it takes to get national approval for a particular product, the, the more restrictive that patent policy, um, the, the more it becomes appropriate when the cost to profit ratio is high. And on the contrary, if you start introducing the kind of push incentives that I talked about earlier, which do bring down the cost of research and development, the, um, the, the more the uh, permissive patent policies become attractive. Uh, policies in which you you give more freedom to um, incumbents to um, to entrants in developing their own drug using the patented product. Now, to conclude, there's loads of different ways that people have approached this problem, this innovation slump, and there's been loads of interesting contributions from various um, from various parts of academia, various uh, private and public um, initiatives. One that I find particularly interesting is the subscription model for, um, for drug development. So this is also called the Netflix model sometimes, and it's considering drugs as intangibles. So in effect, the way that would work is you make a lump sum payment to the, to the drug developer, uh, preferably with installments paid during the early stages of drug development, and that lump sum payment covers any volume of the drug that you can, you can need in the end. So this is good because it completely de-indexes the profits of the pharmaceutical companies from the volumes that they sell, which in general, in terms of health economics is a good thing, right? Because it's nice that people heal and it's nice that people aren't sick. So in particular, in the case of antimicrobial agents, this would both encourage research upstream and make it uh, and align the incentives of the healthcare providers and of the drug developers. Now, um, there's all sorts of other measures. So automated drug discovery is really, um, is really cool. And there's loads of that happening in Oxford at the minute um, in which um, with the help of, of artificial intelligence, um, medical researchers go through um, papers and, and, and processes and find agents that, um, uh, that resemble those existing. Now, of course, that's not what's going to give rise to more lateral innovations in antimicrobial research, but it's generally a good thing that we're able to do that. And, and finally, from, from a behavioral economics perspective, loads of programs have been encouraging um, antimicrobial stewardship. So how do you promote a good, safe and responsible use and prescription of antimicrobial drugs so that we rotate them appropriately so that access re remains high, affordability remains high, and the, the problem is not worsened by misuse of the antimicrobial agents. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to questions and hoping I didn't say anything horribly wrong. Uh, thank you very much, Jesse, much appreciated. Um, yeah, so if we did have um, any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A box. Uh, one sort of I was interested in this idea of this subscription Netflix model. Is there any particular conditions that are, or research is being done for rare conditions with this model now that you, you know of at all? Mm, so it's it's already in place um, or, or, or very, um, it's discussed quite tangibly in the UK. Um, so I, I don't know exactly how much, how much you want to know, um, but the idea would be that the, the, the provider would receive a very high payment across the life cycle of the innovation development. Um, but there's no, there's not really any results at the minute, uh, if that's what you're asking for to say whether this is good, um, and, and very effective or not. Yeah, I was sort of curious uh, for me, but yeah, no, thank you. Um, had a, another question from uh, Charles Fox here. As uh, an antibiotic economist, do you have a view on the UK leaving the EU drug monitoring organisation? Mm, not very strong views. Um, and I'm, I'm not very familiar with the, the direction that the UK is taking in terms of intellectual property in, 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 in particular. Um, because those views aren't, haven't been expressed very, very strongly. So there hasn't been a, an announced significant departure from, um, from the, the policies that are in place um, in the EU. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'll just wait to see if there's any more questions coming through, but 
Uh, might, might be it, I'm afraid, but quite short and sweet. I'll just see if any more pop up. Um, I, I think that's all, if that's all right, sorry, uh, Jesse. But um, yeah, I think I think that kind of brings us to the end of our, our presentations, really. Um, it's just to say, obviously, thank you to, to yourself. Oh, no, sorry, I have had one more question popped there as I was saying that. Um, is there not also a need for better public, sorry, this is from Nicholas McLean. Is there not also a need for better public health education, re correct usage of antibiotics? For instance, resistance can increase if a course of antibiotics is not completed, or in many developing countries, antibiotics are prescribed uh, too freely? So th this is a very interesting question. There's there's obviously two sides of the approach that has been taken antimicrobial stewardship. One side is the, the patient and, and you've seen over the years, many ad campaigns about um, responsible use of antimicrobials at home. No, now the, the, the other problem, which is um, in particular, an issue in in low income country, in low income countries is that of the the medical professionals themselves, um, and and how how feasible it is to prescribe different drugs. So, um, one of the, the 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 actual amount of of regulation um, and and protection for the for patients in in low income countries is is more difficult it's difficult to monitor it's difficult to prevent um capture as well um capture which of course isn't just a low income country problem as as we've seen in 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 particular in america with the the opioid crisis but it's very difficult to prevent um to prevent practitioners from um for instance receiving money for prescribing particular drugs um, it's particularly different, difficult to monitor um, the, the usage that is being made of these drugs by patients. But of course, this is a very active research area and the data is at the minute limited. There's more and more of it. And there's computationally people are trying to improve on the ways that um, the antibiotics are rotated to keep track of, of how much resistance, how much prevalence of resistance there is in, in different, different parts of the world. Um, another, another aspect of this is spillovers. So of course, um, um, bacteria don't have passports. And so the, the geographic tracking of where the prevalence is high um, is, is a difficult issue. The, the study I mentioned at the start by Quo um, 2017, talks about the differences in prevalence across countries in Southeast Asia. And, and the difference is, is oftentimes quite massive. So from one country to the other, you, you'll find different rates of prevalence of, um, of antibiotic resistant strains. So I, I think our, our hope for the future is that the data on these becomes more available, um, including in the in, 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 in developed countries, and that we come up with algorithms and or better uh, communication strategies in order to foster a, uh, an educated, um, really stewarding approach to the, the use and prescription of antibiotics. Oh, thank you very much. Um, oh, and uh, another question here from Charles Fox. Um, if you were a world dictator, would you ban the use of prophylactic use in animal welfare on an industrial scale? Right. I did not talk about this. Um, this was very much the, um, the elephant antibiotic in the room. So loads of the, the antibiotic stock is being used for um, by the agricultural industry. And that's, um, it's a particularly difficult problem because um, of course, the th that adds a, a third uh, a third arm to the access to to cheap medication, cheap and safe medication, the profitability uh, to the produce to the to the pharmaceutical companies, and on top of that, you have the issue of profitability and production of of, of meat and poultry, and and um, and and so, of course, there's the issue that antibiotics effectively reduce. The, the cost of producing the of producing meat and, and poultry and, and fish but I, I I don't have particularly strong views um, other than 
of course, changing uh, changing people's diets is one of the important parts of this. But there's um, th there hasn't been particularly visible trends in approaching the problem of antibiotic prescription in in the agricultural industry. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think that is all our questions. I'm sorry, I keep saying I think that's it, but I think that is all the questions now. Uh, we have got a hand up actually from Gordon, so I might uh, allow him to talk just in case there is another question there. So do bear with me two seconds. Um, uh, Gordon, if you open speak, you need to click unmute, I think. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So can you hear me? Yes, I can indeed, yes. Okay, well, um, I'm Gordon McPherson. Uh, for many years, I was medical tutor at Oriel until I retired in about 10 years ago. And for some years, I was also tutor for graduates. And my wife and I have managed to see, I think, most if not all of these presentations from the MCR. And all I wanted to do was to congratulate the MCR um, for organizing this and for selecting such very good speakers. Um, the talks have all been interesting and we have greatly enjoyed um, being able to remain in touch with Oriel from the depths of deepest Dorset. So to the MCR, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Gordon, for your, for your kind words. And we're going to try and keep these going uh, with the MCR for as, as long as possible, even after sort of uh, things ease off uh, restriction wise. So yeah, we're hoping to keep these going for the foreseeable. So, no, it's, it's great you've appreciated them. Thank you very much.